welcome aboard Just Jets with your captain, Matt O'Leary. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. I'm back. What's going on? Hello and welcome to Just Jets episode number 129. This is an episode that I have no interest in recording and not because I spent 13 hours in a car yesterday, which was only the second worst thing to happen to me. We'll get into all of that, but for some unfortunate jet reasons, we'll get into that and your voicemails. But you guys know the drill. Before we get started, is crotch discomfort hurting your game? Fear no more. The kings of crotch comfort manscaped have spent two years designing the most comfortable boxer briefs in the game. They're sleek, soft, comfortable, and flexible. They're the brand new boxers 2.0 from Manscaped. Take your balls to the royal ball throne. The global leaders in below the waist grooming have the lawnmower 4.0, one of my favorites for the trimming, so you can wear the boxers 2.0 for the chilling. They even trademarked the jewel pouch, so you know. That it's serious. I think it's time for you to invest in your family jewels. So let your bulge breathe and get 20% off and free shipping. Not one, but both. 20% off and free shipping by using code JETS20, J E T S 20. Get yourself something nice. I am actually, I'm literally wearing the boxers right now. I am not going to show you because it's not that kind of program here. We're a family show, but I am literally wearing them as we speak and I am super comfortable. So let's hop into the episode. So you guys probably know the drill. I was away last week. I went to Chicago. I drove, drove on Wednesday of last week. Fine drive, really wasn't that bad. Enjoyed a festival, Windy City Smokeout on Thursday, Sunday. Went to Wrigley on Friday. Took a tour around the city on Saturday. And then spent my time on Monday driving back. And it was roughly 13, maybe a little bit more. Maybe like 14 hours in the car. And as I hinted, that was only the second worst thing to happen to me on Monday. The first worst thing was some Mackay Becton news. And this really stings. It hurts a lot. So as we all know, Makai Becton gets hurt in week one last year, misses the entire season. So we barely saw him. Uh, He had a very, not he in particular, he was just a controversial figure, I guess, a topic of discussion in the offseason by Jet fans, comes into training camp, is in really good shape. Uh, We, you know, we see all this stuff with him. He's coming back, excited to have him back. He's going to play on the right side. That's fine. And then yesterday limping around. That's that's a little strange. Continues to stay in and then leaves with a, an apparent injury to his knee. Great. Fantastic. Robert Sala after practice says it's not something we're really super concerned about. Paraphrasing here, but it seems like, okay, it's going to be all right. So I get that. I, at one of the rest stops on the way, I see that he was a little banged up and I was like, all right, you know, that's annoying, whatever. And then as I'm getting back to New York, my phone is blowing up just nonstop text dms everything i if i didn't get back to you i'm sorry <laughs> there's one i was in the process of driving uh and then just when i got back it was it was very late and i was exhausted but um where the there's a fear that makai becton season could be over so i was just confused how we went to went from it's gonna it's fine he's gonna be okay to season ending in like the span of a few hours and just a god awful road trip back but uh well today Robert Sala pretty much said that Makai Becton's season is over. For the second year in a row, Makai Becton will be out for the season. For the second year in a row, he will play uh, a very non-role with the New York Jets, unfortunately. I was looking forward to Makai coming back. Uh, I thought that he deserved an opportunity to you know, be a starter on this team this year. I have no regrets. Uh, and I don't think the Jets should have any regrets for not taking, you know, Iki Aquanu or Evan Neal or whatever at pick four and taking Sauce Gardner. I thought that Mackay earned the right after his rookie year. Uh, and now, unfortunately, the Jets are going to have to pivot. What do you do now? Well, Dwayne Brown was visiting and uh, unfortunately for the Jets, visiting at the perfect time because Mackay Beckton just went down. So as of recording this on Tuesday afternoon, he has not signed yet. Uh, I would imagine something should get done because Chuma Adoga cannot be your starting right tackle on this team. Just can't. You can't go into the year with Chuma Adoga as your starting tackle. 
It's just they had a, and they had like today was just an awful practice on top of the Makai Becton injury news, which obviously wasn't fun for anybody. That really hurt to see. But then the offensive line just went into a shell. He, like Wilson, I think, was sacked eight times today and like six times on the first seven plays. It's just that they went into a shell. There were a ton of fights breaking out. It was just the last two days have been not very good at New York Jet days. And I just I wanted to be over. Just fix this problem. Um, obviously, it su- again, it sucks for Makai Becton. Uh, Dwayne Brown coming in should mitigate some of the the issues that we'll see on that we've seen, I guess, uh, today on the offensive line. And now the question would be, will Brown be, would Brown play left tackle? Would he sign here to play right tackle? Then do you move fan over to right tackle? Then does fan, it, like this just creates a domino effect that I was hoping that we would not have to deal with as Jeff fans. And, you know, I'll, I'll end my opening monologue with this because I don't really have a whole lot to say on the topic. It's just, it's, it's really, it really sucks to see, but unfortunately what, Sucks even more to see is the I told you so slash the dancing on his grave. Like we it's just social media can be gross sometimes. And I know like the comment section, there's going to be people who say told you so I told you so should have drafted Tristan Wirfs. Like you go right down the line of just piling on this guy in uh, one of the worst moments of his life. Uh, it, it's just it's bizarre. Uh, and even saying like, oh, I'm going to, I'm pulling out the receipts on people who believed in Makai Becton. Like <laughs> what? <laughs> just a bozo, man. You're just so weird. Um, we're a weird flex to be uh, celebrating is the right word, but like taking any kind of, of joy in the injury to be like, I told you so is just bizarre to me. I, I don't like that at all, but at least positive spin zone right now for the team. There is enough time for you to pivot and find uh, a legitimate replacement, which is someone like Dwayne Brown. Uh, he's the one that just, I mentioned him a couple of times already in the open here. It just seems to make the most sense because he was here. He, he visited and he's probably the best available option at this point. He's older, uh, but I think he's still someone who, you know, has enough left in the tank and has a ton of starting experience, which usually there aren't a lot of guys available who have a ton of starting experience at this point uh, in, you know, right. You're into training camp. He is, let's see, a five time pro bowler, including last year. He's an all one time all pro. He's an all pro back in 2012, long time ago with Houston. He's been a starting left tackle his entire career. He's been with Houston since 2018. And uh, most importantly, over the last two years, 17 games started, 16 games started in 2020 and 2021. And like I said, he was a Pro Bowl left tackle last year, a former first round pick from the 2008 draft class by the Houston Texans. Uh, I say you just sign him and figure it out, man. Who's going to play on what side? I don't, I don't care. Just you got to get something done because Chuma Doga can't be this team's starting tackle. And I can't believe we are talking about this now. Uh, it, it was, there was, you know, they were made, pretty much remained injury free for the most part up until this point. And, uh, away we go. It's just, it's annoying. It's frustrating. And it was, you know, something that I was hoping that the jets wouldn't have to deal with, but it's the NFL. It happens. It's unavoidable. And, uh, well, Joe Douglas is going to have to pivot. So we'll see how he pivots. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, Brown signed already. But as I said, recording on Tuesday afternoon, Brown has not signed at this point. So without further ado, we're going to hop into those voicemails. First up is, I believe, Dallas in Virginia. It was very tough to hear the name at the beginning, but I'm going to say Dallas. If not, please correct me, but thank you for calling in. Let's get into it. Matt O'Leary, what's going on, man? This is Dallas Robson from Radford, Virginia. What up, sir? Long-time listener, first-time caller, man. I've been listening to you since the days of 2018. Oof. Subscribed, I believe, on... Somewhere in mid-March of 2018, I know the first video I came across of yours was the New York Jets mock draft of 2018. Wow. So it's been a long time coming for me to actually get the guts to actually call in, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Real quick before I get into what I want to say here, you are a huge inspiration to me. I started my own podcast. I would love to have you on as a guest one day if that interests you. That's enough sure. of the side talk. I want to get into just what I want to say here. And it's not really a question, but I just want to make this statement because all us Jet fans feel this. For a long time, I mean, for what? Has it been 11 years since we've made the playoffs now? Yeah. 
it has just been misery after misery after misery, failure after failure. It, it's been depressing. I'm 21 years old. I have only witnessed one winning season in my entire fandom of the New York Jets. And then, of course, guess how that season ended? Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing like three interceptions in under well. a minute to cost us the playoff spot against the Rex Ryan-led Buffalo Bills, the, the football gods that hated us for a long time. But finally, we are looking in the right direction. For the first time in a long time, I love our quarterback situation, huge Zach Wilson guy. Good. I love the roster for the most part outside of the linebacker core. Matt O'Leary, I think you and I can both agree, along with every other Jets fan in the world, they're not ready for us. They're not ready for when we're good again. Because after these 11 long years of misery, the moment the New York Jets are good again is the moment every NFL football fan, whatever, they're going to witness us like Phoenix rising from the ashes because we're going to be absolutely intolerable. I mean, it's going to be nuts, man. I'm looking forward to it. I don't think it's going to be this year. I think we're going to be solid, but I still think we're about a year away from being an actual playoff team. But we're close, man. And when that day comes, I cannot wait to celebrate it. Even if we're losing the first round of playoffs, I don't give a single damn. <laughs> I just cannot wait for the team to be good again till we get to the point where we can tell everyone that laughed at us and called us the same old Jets, we can tell them where to stick it. That's all for me, man. I look forward to calling one more in the future. And as always, go Jets. Love it. Love that energy and enthusiasm. Uh, obviously, it's been a tough couple of days here for Jet fans with dealing with the Makai Becton injury news uh, and just the the bad offensive performance today at training camp. It's uh, yeah, it's hard to be positive at the moment, but you're right. The team on paper is still significantly better than what we've seen in years gone by. Uh, losing your right tackle in early August shouldn't completely derail your season. If you, if Joe Douglas is as good as most people believe he is, then he should be able to find a appropriate an appropriate alternative here for this team, and it should be enough, uh, you know, to get this thing going in the right direction. But you're right, eleven years is too long. They need to be much more competitive this year, and I still think that we see it. I think there is uh, a path here. Uh, for the New York Jets team in 2022, for them to be competitive and uh, I don't know, look 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 like excuse me a much more complete football team, uh, and hopefully, as we you know mentioned at the top, adding a, a right tackle uh, or trying to figure this thing out at right tackle now is the next step in this process. You mentioned linebackers. Uh, that that is no longer the number one concern for this team. Uh, you know, I think adding Quan Alexander was a nice touch. I'm excited about Quan and CJ Mosley going one two. Uh, ideally, uh, hopefully, as the starters here. But right now, number one thing is figure out right tackle in the next month. You have a month and two days uh, for before the start of the NFL season. So we'll see what happens there. Brandon is calling in from New York. He has his Jet fan story. Okay, let's do it. That was going on, man. This what up, man? Brandon from Queens. Um, I just wanted to chime in on, on, on how I became a Jets fan. Hit me. I know we're probably a little past that, but it's such a cool topic. And I might have the dumbest reason on why I became a Jets fan. But um, growing up as a kid, I grew up in Queens my whole life. Um, so my Mets fandom was obvious. I could there look off go. my terrace and I could see Shea Stadium. Um, plus, my babysitter was the biggest Mets fan. Um, Knicks fandom obvious even though i'm from the same neighborhood as kenny anderson so a lot of us <laughs> you know became uh nets fans but i stuck with the knicks <clears throat> the reason why i became a jets fan even though the giants were the team in new york because growing up i collected a lot of baseball football and basketball cards and i collect football cards and i was always impressed with quarterbacks and their names like, I always was, like, you know, trying to find the coolest quarterback name. Like, Joe Montana was a crazy quarterback name. That is a great like name. Custom Birdie. Like, that was a crazy quarterback name to me. Dante Culpepper. Like, you know, like, the name that had this, this you know, this little pizzazz to it. My favorite quarterback name of all time, hands down, was Boomer Asagas. There you go. Boomer Esiason, 
this time he was a Jets. At this time he was a, J- a Jets quarterback. I had the Boomer Esiason card. I thought he was the best quarterback in the world. <laughs> he being a young, naive kid. And that's how I became a Jets fan. It stuck with me. Plus, you know, they were from New York, so it worked out. But, um, yeah, I just, you know, I love your show. I love what you do, man. I, I, I swear I watch you every day, and it, you, you kind of uh, replaced ESPN Radio for me. I, I tune I in to Matt O'Leary before I go on ESPN Radio. So, <laughs> listen, keep up the good work. I'll be calling you back throughout the season, man. Love what my team is doing. Yeah, Jets up. Let's go. Thank you, man. Really appreciate that. That's cool. That's really cool. I was never, I had uh, baseball cards growing up, but I didn't really collect football cards. And you're right, Boomer Esiason, great name. I mean, great look, too. One, a lefty quarterback is so rare. The flowing blonde hair. I mean, obviously his better days were in Cincinnati, but he did make a Pro Bowl with the Jets in 93. Uh, was, you know, okay for the Jets for a couple of years. He was, what, Jets quarterback for three seasons on, on some unfortunate, pretty bad. Uh, Jets teams in the early 90s but uh, you know lefty quarterback great name as you said he's from well he's a Long Island kid West Islip man so obviously got to show some love for Boomer there but uh, I love that and you know I growing up and being able to look outside and she and see Shea Stadium would have been the coolest thing in the world to me uh, I mi- I still miss Shea uh, obviously it was you know, it was pretty run down by the end and City Field is really nice, but uh something about driving by and seeing the big the big lights at Shea Stadium, it just it, it really it hit different. Um so that really hit close to home. And you mentioned some pretty good quarterback name. Dante Culpepper is a great one. Um who else did you mention? Joe Montana is such a great name. Uh John Elway, I would even put in there. Uh older, but Johnny Unitas. Like these are just some like Football guy, quarterback name, Boomer Esiason is also a phenomenal name. And I'm glad that it got you hooked uh, and you're here and really appreciate you sticking with me and uh, tuning into the show every day really means a lot. We appreciate the love and support. Please call back whenever you can. We're going to go to Ben in New Jersey. He wants to talk some training camp. All right, let's do it. Matt, what's up, my man? How's it going? from Jersey. So I'm just coming back from Jets training camp. Me and my buddy Jeff from Jersey went and actually got VIP tickets. Sick. So we got to meet a bunch of players. We got to meet uh, Quinn Williams, Mackay Beckton, Lakin Tomlinson, Quan Alexander, and a bunch of other players. But I just wanted to um, let you know my takeaway from this training camp. So this was Zach Wilson's best um, training camp, in my opinion. No um, bomb plays like he did. But he did not have any picks. He looked crisp. He was he was making the easy passes. He had a, a, such a nice sideline throw to Corey Davis, who toe tapped that ball. Him and Garrett Wilson just looked electric. Elijah Moore <laughs> looked great as well. Brees Hall looked good. The offense, offensive line was was um, making holes for him. Um, and after the defense, Sauce Gardner looked amazing. There's no way this guy didn't start by week one. He made Ty- he made Tariq Black look like his B quadruple asterisk. You get what I mean. He made him <laughs> fall when he pressed him. Oh, boy. And same thing with the Denzel Mims. He was able to press him, and Mims fell to the ground. Um, no Michael Carter today because he, was, he had an ankle injury. But okay, we got to see some reps from Ty Johnson and Donovan Knight. Which I like Donovan nice Knight. To see. But man, seeing this training camp just got me so excited for this year. Brees Hall was out hyping up the fans. DJ Uzama was um, DJ Uzama was hyping up the fans as well. And Braxton Berry, this guy's a man. And I'm just so excited for this year. And um, yeah, let's um, let's hope that this, that Zach training camp today can um, progress into the season and we can win some games this year. Um, let me know your thoughts, and as always, go Jets. This one was from last Tuesday or Wednesday, I believe. Uh, and, yeah, it's been a little bit of a rocky road for the offense uh, up and down, but there are some really exciting points. Uh, as you mentioned, Sauce Gardner being one of them and Brees Hall, two rookies who are going to be uh, very impactful guys, starters from day one, and going to have very important roles on this New York Jets football team. 
Uh, I'm bummed I haven't been able to get to training camp yet. Uh, unfortunately, ever since uh, they've moved full time to New Jersey, haven't been to a ton of training camps. Usually like to make it out for at least the green and white scrimmage. Uh, was away this past weekend, so unable to make it out. But there were some positives from that that I loved watching the videos. So appreciate anyone who, you know, took videos and tweeted it out of the green and white. That was so sick to see. And uh, yeah, it's just. I agree with a lot of the things you were saying from everything that I've been following along with. It, it very much so feels like the guys that you mentioned are uh, difference makers. And uh, again, it's going to go, this episode is going to point back to, you know, the, the little bit of uh, the, the bummer that is losing Makai, but hopefully that's not something that completely puts this season into a tailspin before it gets started. That's something that you should be able to, uh, you know, o- overcome. And if Zach Wilson's the guy, then we should be able to see that. I would hope. Let's go Vinny and Peak Skill. All right, Vin, what do you got for us this week? Hey, Matt, it's Vinny from Peak Skill. What's up, man? To say, well, first off, kind of sorry for my last call being a bit of a dick. So <laughs> You're good. If we Don't meet worry, up man. week one, I owe you an overpriced MetLife beer. And secondly, I thought I'd finally tell you the story of how I became a Jets fan. It's a little complicated, but I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. So I didn't grow up in sports. I was more of a geek culture, history guy. So my first game was Super Bowl 42, and I wouldn't watch another one until Super Bowl 51. So in between that, I did my usual geek, geek culture, history thing, and I stumbled, while digging through my town's history, I stumbled on the Jets practicing here, and it piqued my interest. So I then found a blog from a local describing his summers spent here when the Jets would come, and it was fascinated me and it sent me down this rabbit hole of AFL documentaries, Super Bowl documentaries, Jets documentaries and piqued my interest. So you flash forward to 2017, the Super Bowl I watched Super Bowl 51 for some strange reason I don't know why I turned on the TV that day I I felt sick to my stomach after watching it (laughs) I decided to get back into sports actually I got back into sports earlier when I, watched, when I started watching the 2016 NL playoffs, which did obviously include your unfortunate humiliation at the hands of the San Francisco uh, Giants. Yeah. Connor Gillespie. But back on topic, so when football season rolled around, I just don't know why, I just I just picked the Jets. It's like, <laughs> I, for some reason, I just knew I didn't want to be a Giants fan for some reason. It might have to do with my love of the color green. There you go. But that's all. And go Jets. There we go, Vin. Yeah, I, I'm not not super surprising just based on, you know, obviously know you throughout the years of uh, commenting and interacting and calling in and you're very history orientated. So uh, in a way, feel similar, a similar connection to the Jets as you, because as I mentioned before, the Jets used to practice uh, at Hofstra, which is 10 minutes maybe less than 10 minutes on a good day from where I live. Uh, So growing up, it felt like, I I don't know if it was, but it very much so felt like it was multiple times a week. We're going to Jets practices. I feel like right now that now there's like, I don't know, five open practices for the fans that you can go to in training camp. I was probably, I was going at least five times a summer, if not, not more than that. We were going pretty often here. Uh, and that was in the early 2000s. Up until I think the Favre year was the last year uh, that they had regular practices over uh, at Hofstra. And I, I miss it. I miss it a lot. It was the absolute best. Uh, met a lot of really cool Jets uh, and a lot of really interesting people. Um, you know, just Jet fans and being really into it. Again, the Favre year was the last year of it. Um, But yeah, it it was different then too. Like I feel like a lot of like now, the one of the last times I went, I went up to court when they were in Cortland one year, and they sent around like the undrafted free agents to sign for the kids, and it was like nobody even knows who this is. But uh, yeah, I remember my sister getting Lavernius Coles' autograph. Um, I've I've got Dustin Keller, Thomas Jones, Brad Smith. Uh, David Harris, you know, all the guys in the, you know, mid 2000s, right before that run in that, you know, 2004, five, six, seven, eight era of Jets football, I met a lot of, a lot of guys. And uh, it, it's some of my best memories as a Jet fan. So I, I miss that a lot. And uh, 
Well, it's it sounds like when you know the Jets practice in peak skill, obviously that guy it, it meant a lot to him too. We're gonna close out with John calling in from Tennessee, and he has a scenario for us. All right, John, what do we got this week? Hey Matt, this is John out of Tennessee. Thanks for the content as always. No problem. Uh, just curious about your thoughts on uh, two different things, mostly. So, first one is let's say Wilson shows he is the guy, and uh, we we know that we keep the guy going in, but Robert Sala just doesn't get the team together. We end up with a you know five, maybe six win uh, team, but just not enough to where. Uh, enough to where we 100% know Zach's the guy that the defense wasn't performing as it should, whatever it is. Do you think that this team gets rid of Sala and keep Joe Douglas at that point, or do you mm. think that they would both be going? Do you think they'd get Sala one more year because maybe injuries are what caused it or whatever it is? What do you think the situation is if Zach's definitely the guy, but we're questioning Sala a lot by the end of the year? Uh, second part would be I'm curious what you think of our backup slot cornerback position. My personal opinion is the Jets, if uh, Michael Carter were to go down, that it's not just, you know, play here or there, but now if he were to actually go down, that we would see EJ maybe slide into that uh, slot role, and then we would see if we still have Bryce Hall, him take over the other side, or in my preference, Brandon Eccles, who I think has a higher ceiling than Bryce Hall, actually. Ooh. But just curious what you think, what we would see, in your opinion, if uh, Michael Carter were to go down because that's the only corner position that I don't feel like we have as much depth if we're not using Reed in that position. Because I don't think Hall or Eccles are good for that slot role, personal. Um, Again, just curious what your thoughts are. And as always, go Jets. Thanks. Yeah, uh, so I'll do the first part first. And thank you, John, for calling in here. Um, I think that... I don't think they would move on from Salah under that scenario. I, I think they would... I think both Salah and Douglas would feel a lot of pressure, though, going into 2023. And that would be the deciding year. Uh, I don't think they would necessarily want to bail on him after two years and keep Joe Douglas. I think it would be you know, a, a clear, a clean slate kind of thing, both going. And I don't think that would be the case after 2022. I think they'd give him another run. Probably at that point, I would say definitely change the defensive coordinator. Um, and then looking at the slot cornerback position, I would think Javelin Gidry gets that role. And I know he's not as much of a household name guy as Bryce Hall and Brandon Eccles. And Brandon Eccles surprised me and, I, I don't know if I agree that I would say he has a higher ceiling than Bryce Hall, even though I think they both are capable corners. I think both of those guys are, you know, meant to play on the outside, which is un under your scenario they're doing, and DJ Reed's going in the slot. But I don't think you're paying DJ Reed all that money and then moving him into the slot where he just he wasn't as effective. I think you want him and Sauce Gardner starting on the outside, and you're using Eccles and uh, Hall for depth beyond that on the outside. Uh, and I think Gidry Gidry's your answer there um, in the slot. It, it might not be pretty. Uh, I thought he took a little bit of a step back last year, but I think that would be your most likely scenario is that Gavlin, Javelin Gidry, excuse me, would be the one uh, to get it done. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below or on social media. As always, please make sure to subscribe either on YouTube or in audio form, wherever you listen to the show. Leave a rating, review, a comment, question, whatever you got, leave it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Matt O'Leary, and I'll catch you next time.